As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Mark 13, verse 1. And as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. 
And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days." And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven." From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. End time fears and excitement seem to ignite in every generation. In the late 1990s, the Left Behind books released causing a renewed fervor about the nearness of the end of the world. The year 2000 was a major point when people thought the end of the world would certainly come. The Mayan calendar declared the end of the world to be in 2012. The Jehovah's Witnesses proclaimed the end of the world not once, not twice, not three times, not four, 
but seven times. 1914, 1918, 1925, 1940, 1975, 2000, and now 2033. Hysteria seems to always be centered on when the end of the world will come and the various predictions that come. Often these predictions come from reading Mark chapter 13 or the parallel passages of Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Now we've already read Matthew 24 in our daily Bible reading and we'll look at Luke 21 later in the year. So right now we're going to focus carefully on what Jesus says and teaches in Mark chapter 13 and what we should understand as followers of Christ. Now, the first few verses are critical for properly understanding the teachings in this chapter. We noted in the last few chapters that Jesus has been at the temple in Jerusalem giving his final teachings to the people before he is arrested. Mark 13 opens with Jesus and his disciples now leaving the temple complex. One of the disciples says to Jesus to consider the magnificent buildings of the temple. Now, I think it's important to consider that this is not a sightseeing tour, nor is this the first time that Jesus and his disciples have come to the temple. Jesus, as an obedient Jew, would have presented himself at the temple at least three times each year. All these men have been to the temple many times in their lifetime. So what is the disciple doing by pointing out the magnificence of the temple? Well, we've noticed contextually in the last few chapters that Jesus has condemned the religious leaders and declared the fall of the temple and Jerusalem. We saw that with the curse of the fig tree, the cleansing and condemnation of the temple, and the parable of the tenants. So after two days of condemning the temple and its leaders, one of the disciples finally remarks about the temple as a point of national pride. This is quite parallel to the people in the days of Jeremiah who were in disbelief that God would judge the nation because they possessed the temple. God is with us was the thinking because the temple stood there. The temple represented God with his people. So it was like, see, Jesus, we have the temple. Aren't we something? But Jesus says, in spite of the grandeur and the magnificence of the temple, not one stone will be left on another every stone will be thrown down. Jesus plainly states what has been implied in the teachings and parables in the last few days. So we get down to verse 3. Jesus leaves the temple and goes to the Mount of Olives, which is opposite of the Temple Mount. Now it's interesting to note that this is what Ezekiel pictured when the glory of the Lord left the temple and went to the nearby mountain, indicating that God is leaving his people. So now Jesus leaves the temple and goes to the nearby mountain. Four of the disciples privately ask Jesus about what he just said. Listen to what they ask in verse 4. When will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? When will these things happen? Now, to answer that, we have to ask, what is the context? The context is the destruction of the temple. The context is that the temple will not have one stone left on another. They are asking when this will happen. They are also asking what sign they can have to know that the destruction of the temple is about to happen. They want to know two things. When will the temple be destroyed? And what signs are there to know that the temple is about to be destroyed? Did the disciples ask anything about when the end of the world would come? No, not in this context. Did they ask anything about the second coming of Christ here? No. In fact, we have seen that they have not understood the fact that Jesus is leaving them. They don't understand that Jesus is going to be killed and raised from the dead. And they certainly are not asking about the second coming of Christ or the end of the world. They're asking about the destruction of the temple and the judgment against the nation, which has been in the context of the last three chapters and the context of the last words that Jesus just said. Now, Jesus begins to describe events that will happen before the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus calls these things in verse 8, 
the beginnings of the birth pains, false messiahs, wars and rumors of wars, famines and earthquakes are just the beginning signs. Now, again, these are not signs for today, but signs for the eventual fall of Jerusalem and the temple. In verse 9, Jesus says they will stand before councils like the Sanhedrin, beaten in the synagogues, and stand trial before governors and kings. When we get to John's gospel later in the year, we'll see Jesus, in fact, promises apostles that the Holy Spirit would tell them what to say when this would take place. And we see Jesus saying the same thing in verse 11. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now, we will see the record of those things that take place in the book of Acts. These signs are recorded there, and they all lead up to the destruction of the temple. But I would also have you note here that before the temple is destroyed, the gospel must be preached to all the nations. Remember in our study in Romans 16 and verse 26, Paul said that the gospel had been made known to all nations. He said that in Colossians 1 and verse 6 as well, and Colossians 1 and verse 23. Jesus here, though, then calls for them to endure through these difficulties to the end in order to be saved. Now, after telling his disciples about the beginning signs, Jesus now gives further signs of what will happen in leading up to the temple's destruction. The big sign is in verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are on Judea flee to the mountains. Now notice that the reader needs to understand the imagery of the abomination of desolation. When they see this abomination of desolation, that is when people in Judea need to run to the mountains. Now, I want us to think about this for a moment. If this is about the end of the world or the second coming of Jesus, what good would it be to run to the mountains? And why would only people in Judea need to run to the mountains? It doesn't make sense. No, this is still about the signs leading up to the temple's destruction. The people need to evacuate Jerusalem and Judea quickly when they see the abomination that causes desolation. So what is the abomination of desolation? Well, that term is used in Daniel's prophecies in the scriptures. Daniel 9 verse 27, Daniel 11 verse 31, and Daniel 12 verse 11. They all speak of an enemy or a power attacking Jerusalem. The time frame of those references centers upon the rise of the Roman Empire. It is not that the reader was to look for the exact person. It came to symbolize an unspeakable affront to the sanctity of God's house and to God himself. Essentially, you're going to see a Gentile ruler or power, which it ought not be. Now, we'll see this understanding validated by Luke's parallel account, which, rather than calling this the abomination of desolation, simply says in Luke 21, verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. When you see an army coming where it ought not to come, then you need to run to the mountains. You need to not go back for your belongings. You just need to go because it's going to be really, really bad. It'll be awful for pregnant and nursing mothers. And in fact, pray that this does not happen in winter because it will be hard to travel. The big message is that when the armies come into Judea, then you need to go fast. Only God is going to prevent the destruction of Jerusalem from being worse than it could be. This is what they are to be looking for. In verse 23, Jesus says, be on guard. Watch for these things I've told you. Now, verse 24, Jesus now describes the event itself when he begins with, after that tribulation. So after these birth pains and signs will be judgment. Now, people have a tendency to read verse 24 on and presume that this must be talking about the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus. Because the text says that the stars will fall from heaven, 
the sun will be darkened, and the Son of Man will come in the clouds. Now the question we need to ask ourselves, that in the context of what's going on, in the context of the questions that's been posed to Jesus, should we shift the context here? Should we assume that Jesus is no longer talking about the fall of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem, but now is talking about the bigger picture, about the end of the world? Well, the answer is no. No. Because the things that Jesus says here is used commonly in other places in Scripture, this particular language, for the fall of a nation. Let's leave Mark for just a moment and turn to Isaiah 13. In Isaiah 13, so let's skip down to verse 9 and see this language here. In Isaiah 13 and verse 9, Isaiah is prophesying about Babylon. Notice what he says. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant, and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make people more rare than fine gold, and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now, this also sounds like end of the world language here. But if we look at the context that Isaiah places on this, notice he says, verse 1, the oracle concerning the end of the world? No. Babylon. Babylon. This is a prophecy against Babylon. And what we see here is that Isaiah uses, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the words that God has given Isaiah to say, language that is graphic, apocalyptic, to describe the end of the nation. And that's why I think Jesus uses the same kind of imagery for Jerusalem. By the way, another connection to the book of Isaiah. Every page we find Isaiah. This is the end of the Jewish age as they knew it. This is the end of the nation as God brings judgment on it for its sins. But what about this passage, though, saying that the Son of Man would come in the clouds? There, verse 26. Same kind of deal here. Oftentimes, scriptures talk about God coming in the clouds, and that is pictured as judgment. One example is Revelation 1 and verse 7. We'll be towards the end of the year before we get to Revelation. But I think the easiest place to see this is in Matthew 26 and 64. Remember from earlier this year, Jesus tells Caiaphas, the high priest, that he would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. How would this high priest, this man, human, see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven if that is a reference to the end of the world. What we need to see is that none of this language refers to the end of the world specifically, but to God's judgment upon a people. And we must read with an understanding and knowledge of how God uses these pictures of judgment in other places to properly understand what Jesus is teaching here. So the context continues that Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of this Jewish nation. And the same is true with verse 27, where God is gathering together his people, which is frequently used in the scriptures as well. Isaiah 43 and verse 6, particularly here for us. But we also see this language in Deuteronomy 30, Psalm 50, Jeremiah 32, and Ezekiel 34. Nothing in this passage says that God is gathering his people and taking them to heaven. Rather, God is gathering his scattered children, which is a reference to Deuteronomy 30, verses 3 and 4, where God will gather his people from all parts of creation and bring them into his promised land. 
Now, Jesus says to learn the lesson. And what lesson is that? When you see the signs, then you know certain events are going to happen. And here's the fig tree. When the leaves come out, we know that summer is coming. For us today, that's when you see the pollen. It's the middle of spring for us right now as I record this. Everything is in bloom. The trees have full leaf on them. People are starting to plant their gardens. Even though the mornings are still pretty cool, the nights are still pretty cool, the days are getting warmer. And we know in less than three or four weeks, it's going to be hot all the time. Summer is coming. And that's what Jesus says in verses 30 and 31. Notice verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until what things? All these things take place. If there's any doubt, this verse eliminates any idea that this chapter is about the second coming of Christ or the end of the world. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. The disciples also asked a question about when the temple would be destroyed. And Jesus declares the day or hour is unknown. Only the Father knows when he is going to accomplish this. The point seems to be that that God has not determined the exact hour and day for Jerusalem's fall. What is certain is that it will fall within the lifetimes of the audience listening to Jesus' words. So what are the disciples to do? Be on guard. Keep awake. Again, verse 35, stay awake. And again, verse 37, stay awake. Jesus says, because you don't know exactly when the judgment on Jerusalem would come, they need to stay ready and be watchful. Now, as we wrap up chapter 13 here, I do want to make note again, nothing here is talking about the end of the world or the second coming of Christ. This is not what the disciples asked about, nor is it within the context of this discussion. To say that, that this is about the end of the world, is to push something into the text that just isn't given. The other thing I would say about this is that the second coming of Christ does not have signs or warnings. The scriptures do not offer any warning signs or things to look out for when Christ does return. I don't always like going to long readings from other texts in the scriptures when we're trying to focus on one chapter of the Bible, but I think it's important to make this case. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5. Notice here what he says. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do. But let us keep awake and be sober. What did Paul say about how Jesus would come? Like a thief. For those of you who have had the unfortunate experience of having a thief break into your home, did that thief call you up ahead of time? And say, hey, on Tuesday night at 10 o'clock, going to break in, steal your TV. Did that happen? Receive a text. When you're at work today, about lunchtime, I'm going to come in and take your computer. Anyone happen like that? What happens when you least expect it? You come home and you find the door ajar or a window broken or something out of place. And you realize someone has been in your home and you come in and you find the place ransacked and items missing. There aren't any warning signs. So we turn on the news and we see things like wars and tsunamis and communism or enemy nations of ours joining forces. None of those things are signs for the second coming of Christ. 
We're not to look out at the world and think that Jesus is coming soon. Now, we can look at our nation and perhaps say that judgment is coming soon, but that's not the same as the end of the world. Jesus' return is unknown. There are no signs or warnings given. So what should we do? Well, I think just like Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 13, be ready. There's an old fable that tells about three apprentice devils who were sent to earth by Satan to finish their apprenticeship. The devil asked them about their plans to tempt people and lead them astray. The first demon said, I will tell them that there is no God. Satan said, That will not delude many, for they know that there is a God. The second said, I will tell men that there is no hell. Satan replied, You will deceive some that way. The third said, I will tell men there is no hurry. Satan excitedly responded to him, Go, and you will ruin them by the thousands. We do need to watch and be ready. Since the Lord will return without warning, we should live our lives prepared for the Lord to return at any moment. We should not assume that we have tomorrow to get our lives right with the Lord. We should not assume that things will keep on going as they are. We should ask ourselves every day if we are ready for the Lord's return now. Are you ready if the trumpet sounds and the dead arise in the next five minutes? Are you ready or do you need to get ready? That's the point that the Lord is making to us. We need to always be ready for judgment, whether it is the judgment of the land we live in or whether it is the Lord's return. We need to be ready. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.